Hey, it's MC here, and we're going to be talking about emotions and interaction design today. And some of the cool things about emotion and interaction is that they're inseparable. When we talk about knowledge representation and about cognition, you can't get away from emotions. A lot of people would say that judgment, uh, to be logical and rational, is to be free of emotion turns out that our, uh, what are referred to as emotional responses um, are a strong part of when we fire up being supposedly very logical. Uh, there are parts of our brain, the older parts of our brains, not the cortex that's wrapping us. So we've got the big old cortex here, terrible drawing, and this brain stem here and right up in here in this middle bit. Um, and down this stem is called the midbrain. We have all sorts of responses that take care of us and get triggered very quickly to respond to situations to see if we are in threat or no threat. You can check out work by Paul Ledoux on this uh, simple response. And so this brain here, the wrapper here, the cortex, that's new stuff. This down here, where the amygdala is and the hypothalamus and so on is what's often referred to as the uh, old brain and uh, uh, an emotionally responsive brain. And somehow that is thought to be, like I said, irrational. Turns out, no, not so much. Emotions are a key part of our judgment, discernment, and part of what's really a big deal about cognition is that judgment part. And also helps identify what's important believe it or not. Uh, and we see that in people's faces. We have facial reactions like disgust is a really critical facial reaction to something. And you can get a sense that um, why do we have these responses? Well, because we're not alone. And we looked at the notion in the last video about being social creatures. Well, it seems that we are wired to almost reflexively uh, a little bit past reflex, so after we have a reflexive response and we have a quick mental think about it, this is also in the area of the book called Thinking, let me put a note here, Thinking, Fast and a Slow, that some of the things that happen uh, quickly are these assessments around threat, and we are wired to respond to them in a way that is shown in our faces. And what work by Paul Ekman did, I'm not actually sure, he might have a C in there as well, Paul Ekman, uh, looked at was that all of these responses are pretty similar across cultures, which again suggests that we're wired to have them for why? A survival response. We're showing our, our friends in our tribe or our foes uh, how we feel, what we think, uh, as part of our response to a particular situation. And so our facial uh, responses connect with how we are thinking or feeling uh, about things. And so our emotional responses to an interaction design are not irrational. Um, they're really just very primitive and they've been used for survival responses. So uh, they reflect over here, we've got them as our judgment related and they reflect a lot about us. They're not absolute, something that could completely um, really upset us, like how I worked for two hours on a website uh, form the other night to put together a proposal and there was no warning uh, or message to say you need to save your work now or you're going to be logged out in two minutes. None of that, so I just kept working for two hours and then found out when I went to save it, hit the save button, I was logged out and all that work was gone. I was struggling to stay balanced about that and that might be because I was a little more tired and so my stress hormones were a little more uh, fast to be reacted uh, or triggered and so my physiological state was having an effect on whether I was responding to this in a particular zen way like oh I'll get those two hours back somewhere um, or not. When you look at kids with autism they have a hard time focusing on what's important. If you ask them what's going on in a picture, for instance, and it's a picture of a sailboat and some people out in a sailboat, they might focus on, well, the, the color of the grains of sand or something, not what most people would be 
looking at when they say, can you describe that picture? So there's, there's um, without emotion, uh, or those access to the emotional processes in the brain, um, our discernment is, let's just say, very different, and it can be socially disconnected. So that's all to make the case that emotion is important. Once we realize that, then we can use that for interaction as a way of assessing effectively if our emotions are not getting triggered, if we're not going into that threat place, then we can look at um, how uh, we can assess an interface in terms of supporting experiences of success and engagement or whether we're getting uh, something that is not successful, which is frustration. So we can look at how an interface creates an experience by how it engages with us around some kind of process. So again, if we use the shopping example, that's really easy one to get a handle on. We have a particular set of tasks that we're going to be doing. We want to know if they're completed our expectations are met, how difficult is it to do the task, we might be able to do the task, but it takes a lot of steps or we're feeling frustrated, or it seems effortless and it was fun and we were in a state of flow, so that was all wonderful, and uh, it seems that instead of being concentrating on the experience and being interrupted and having to figure things out, we just get through it. In fact, there's a standard for looking at this, and this standard is on usability and you can check that out on Wikipedia and that it has three components to it effectiveness uh, efficiency and satisfaction and I'm not going to go into those you can check those those out um, but that is the gold standard of usability and again just a quickie on on efficiency this is is might be step counting how many steps does it take to complete a task well Alan Dix who was visiting us the other day has this lovely uh, revision to that that suggests it's not about step counting so much as it is uh, or cost benefit in actual quantifiable ways but it's about perceived benefit and perceived cost in other words something might take 10 steps but it feels fantastic easy and very effective uh, whereas something could take two steps and it feels horrible so it's really more important to get into that feeling, again, that emotional response of what is more satisfying. Interestingly, uh, another guy by the name of Andrew Dillon from the University of Texas at Austin in the Information School has this other concept that's a little more human, I'd say, uh, for assessing the usability of an interaction. And why I call it transparent is it means the degree to which you can focus on what you're doing as opposed to whether or not the interaction is letting you do that. And he talks about POA, or Process Outcome Affect. And the idea is very simply, does the process in which you're engaged reflect what you think should be happening? So can you put your bag of coffee into your uh, shopping cart, if that's what you're doing online? And, and is the outcome of that process what you expect? Once you've got the coffee in there, um, are you able to see it through each step so that you can say, yeah, it's there and I can purchase it. And when you've purchased it, you get some kind of note that says, hey, you've purchased this coffee. It's on its way to you. And also in terms of an assessment of that uh, in interaction, is it a positive or a negative affect? In other words, if it's a positive affect, what you're trying to design for, the person using your system feels empowered, like they could do that. Effect is a good word to, to look up. Also, when you're involved in that process, some of the things that we really like to look for are, are good feedback, how we can find out about the status of something. So this, there's this, just wanted to draw your attention to, there's this uh, block of text in the textbook that talks about what happens when you get weird error messages or frustrating error messages, that these can really set you off as feedback as opposed to messages that encourage you and give you some kind of process information like these smiley and sad Macs over here. In fact, the smiley Mac used to show up when the computer was starting up and that was fantastic because it said everything's okay. And why would you need to have something there that was a smiley Mac? Because it took about seven years for the computer to start up. And so you'd like to know that the computer at least thinks it's having a good time and you don't have to worry about it. If you saw this icon, the not smiley Mac, the sad Mac it was called, when the computer showed up with the X's for eyes, 
uh, you more or less had a dead hard drive and it was just trying to boot and couldn't get there. So that was not the image you ever really wanted to see. But the fact of the matter is that it was there was a clear-ish message about some very coarse-grained state levels, which was it's going the way it thinks it should be going, just hang in there, or it's not going to happen at all. And now you know you can do something else and stop wasting your time waiting for this thing to come around. So we go back down here. What that's telling us is that the feedback is giving us uh, a sense of choice, which is the opposite, if you will, of threat. Threat and stress and frustration, all things you might know about in this class so far, uh, are when you don't know what's going on and you don't know if you can have a, a choice. And so we are triggered and you go into this uh, fight or flight state and you're having a hormonal response, physiological, natural, very primitive, um, and it's hard to get out of, uh, to shake out of that, to go, is this really a problem? But when you're in that place, as a designer, when you're looking for that, um, and you want to mitigate that, some of the choices you have, again, are think about where are you giving people feedback and how are you giving it to them? Is it in a way that those people can understand? So, Smiley Mac, we could learn very quickly that means things are okay. Telling somebody you've just hit a 56270 error interrupt might not be that effective a, a message to reduce threat for somebody who doesn't have a clue what that is going on. So just to review really quickly that emotions are not irrational. They are cues, they are often social cues to convey information about whether something is safe or not, or whether an experience has been horrible or not, so that somebody knows where other members of the tribe are at and can respond appropriately, or whether there are bad things in the environment that have to be dealt with. As I said, that's old brain stuff. It's very primitive. It's very useful because it does plug into the bigger cortex stuff like um, information processing, language, judgment, um, and so on. It's just that sometimes we really push on triggering that threat response uh, with a system that can make us feel like idiots because it's seemingly important but we can't necessarily control it. So as designers we need to be able to then with this kind of model about whether it's uh, this usability model of effectiveness, efficiency, satisfaction or Dylan's model of process outcome affect to be able to evaluate each part of our design each part of the process of a design to say, is this uh, an emotionally satisfying uh, experience? Can we get to flow here? Is it delightful? Or are there parts of the uh, experience that are not doing what we expect and causing us to be frustrated because it's not clear how to get out of them? And that comes back to actually what we we're looking at in chapter two around things like interface types. So are there interface types that make what to do next in a process uh, clear to us so that we can exercise that choice again. Um, so super, super sum up is that emotions are uh, a key part of our experience. It's not just putting a smiley on something to convey to somebody else how we're feeling, um, which is okay. Uh, it is about what feeling is actually being triggered that we might not be particularly aware of, but that will affect our experience of what we are interacting with. And so as you go on now and look at things that uh, are going to come up around qualitative and quantitative design methods, uh, that's not only for how do you design something and do requirements gathering, but how do you evaluate it. And so this guy over here, process outcome affect, I would suggest is a really good place to look when you're thinking about your design and especially when you're evaluating your design and if the user tells you they're having problems with a part of the design, check out which of these three components are being disrupted uh, at some point. Uh, value those emotional responses and check out if you can mitigate them. When you do, you'll see that you'll help somebody get to flow and delight rather than feeling frustrated. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for hanging in there, and I'll look forward to, as always, your questions, and I'll make sure this graphic for you, the background graphic, is up on the wiki. All right, have a, a great weekend. We're almost there. All right, 
See you soon.